Somebody offer thanks for us, Mike. Would you do that? All right. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day. We thank, thank you that we're up and around this morning, and uh, we just ask you to bless this food to our bodies. And I uh, thank uh, and ask you to bless Bob for bringing us a lesson every week. And uh, pray we have a great service this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, the, <clears throat> the creed talks about two aspects of what God does for us. Forgiveness of sin and the resurrection of the body and the life, well, three aspects. Yeah, life. Resurrection of the body and the life, life everlasting. Yeah. Uh, of course. And they uh, were just considering the, the resurrection and how that was uh, debated in the early centuries. It's amazing how many how many Christians are unaware of of the, of the creed and like when it when it originated and stuff like that. We were talking about it in our Sunday school class, and most of these are old Christians. These are not you know new Christians. These are Christians have been Christians for 50 years, right? And they're you know unaware. I, I passed this out to all the guys. Well, they didn't go through catechism in the Catholic, the Lutheran Church, or the, or the uh, Episcopal Church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or they know it, right? Uh, I, I did find it very... Uh, I had been to uh, Bible college three years before I ever went to seminary. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we had a reading in the early church fathers. I had a couple of little books. You know, you, a lot of these names like Tertullian, Irenaeus, Origen, uh, and others, we were reading lo lo longer passages. I, I thought, yeah, these old guys, they really they had a little understanding. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's interesting to see what, how they uh, uh, develop their doctrines and the kind of things they had to confront, particularly with, with the Gnostics. Uh, they spent some time thinking about this stuff, yeah, didn't they? Yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah. uh, Heine says there in the beginning, I, I, look, I quoted this sentence here at the beginning, <clears throat> eschatology, Eschatology means eschaton, means the word in, and logos means teaching. Teachings about the end. end. He says that's the doctrine, the italicized, emphasized, the doctrine that lifts all the other doctrines out of the realm of mere historical interest or curiosity and gives them contemporary relevance. In other words, you take the doctrine of uh, uh, the fact that God is the creator, right? That's an important doctrine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. God is the creator of heaven and earth. Uh, and Jesus Christ, his son, who was uh, incarnate and who died, that's an important doctrine, isn't it? But what, what, why is that relevant? He, Contemporary. Why is that relevant to us? He says it's the it's the doctrine of the future of the end that makes all of that relevant. Mm -hmm. I got to thinking about that. Why why does eschatology have relevance for us? Or make it, why does it make all of these other doctrines relevant? What does he mean by that? Take the relevance of well, the, 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 in, the, the incarnation. Result, right? Doctrine of the incarnation. Yeah. If there were no future, would it really matter? So God came to earth in Jesus Christ and he died on the cross. But if there's no future, it doesn't really matter, does it? Is that relevant to you 
Oh, yeah. Well, and especially since... Be a high, curious fact in history. Especially since Christianity teaches that that believing in Christ is not going to make this life easier. Yeah. So it's not going to make this life easier. So if there was no future for it, okay, right. then, then what would be the point of, not very well, of, of suffering for Christ now? You know, if there was no future. That's an interesting historical curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Well, this man Jesus was actually the son of God. That's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, all, uh, just like another historical fact, that it's kind of interesting, but what does it have to do with me today? It's the future that, that, uh, that all of that guarantees, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In fact, of course, it's the resurrection of Jesus. <coughs> isn't it? That's the basis of our hope for a resurrection. You know, if Christ isn't raised, is there any hope for us? It's, it's only the future that, that makes it a, a religion of hope. Yeah. Killed me. I, I read something that... Barna survey, I don't know, this is probably five or six years ago now, it's a, a high percentage of people who call themselves Christians didn't believe in the resurrection. Like, wow, I mean, that's, that's sort of a basic, you know? You know. <laughs> How do you call yourself a Christian? <laughs> what? I, how do you get there from here, you know? You believe in Jesus just because he was a good teacher. Well, but... Uh, so he's got some good teaching. Do you live up to it? No. no try to. <laughs> so, try to. <laughs> if you believe in Jesus as a good teacher, it's probably just going to leave you depressed. It? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at the Sermon on the Mount. How far short do I fall mm. of that? How many times have I had anger in my brother and committed right. murder in my heart? Yeah. I had a little lust for another woman. I mean, this teaching of Jesus really makes me really a terrible bring you down. sinner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I, if I was looking for a teacher, I'd probably look for another teacher who wouldn't, who wasn't quite so, as, as as strict. <laughs> and, as and, even, and even the sacrifice. Okay, even if you believe, okay, he, he died for our sins as a sacrifice, even if you believe in that part, okay, I, to what end? What's, what's the point? Okay, right. so my sins are forgiven. If there's no future, then what's the point of that? <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's, 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 it's that which distinguishes, too, the... the difference between basically all the other gods who are idols because those are all those are all present religions they're all they're all doing things to to try and please their gods in right. the present so that he'll be kind to them in the present well they <coughs> The doctrine of the resurrection was debated, uh, and, and there was this Gnostic element. And, uh, you, we find it even in the New Testament. Right? Remember the epistle of John talks about these people. Uh, second, second John, for example. Second John. Verse 7. What does that say? Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Uh, they deny that Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. They don't deny Jesus Christ. Right. They deny that he came in the flesh. Yeah. And why would they do that? Why would they deny that he was an actual human being in the flesh? Because they didn't believe in resurrection. Their belief was that anything fleshly right. was so low and bad that it could not provide any hope for deliverance. The, the, uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ 
was considered to be some kind of spiritual presence that communicated a secret knowledge. Salvation is a matter of, of getting the right teaching about your true nature, that you are really a spiritual being, and that your flesh has nothing to do with that. Do you know of any kind of teaching today that's similar to that, that says your flesh has nothing to do with your identity? <laughs> it's modern wokeness, right? Yeah. You know, the fact that, that I've got a penis has nothing to do with my identity. I can be a woman, I can be a man, or I can be, in be I can be something in between. I can be neither. Right? That has and how can that be? Because it's a matter of my will and my spirit knowing who I am. That I'm a spiritual being and it's not connected to my body at all. That's a very Gnostic way of looking at human identity. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the body. Uh, and in some ways, it's it's a kind of very ultra. It's a kind of very spiritual way of looking at your identity. But uh, the the Bible talks about the body as being very important. God created us male and female, right? Mm -hmm. He specifies that we have a certain sexual identity, which is really tied up with our body, isn't it? Great. Yeah. Thank you. And you got your sugar, or you want the sugar? No, I have it. I, I'm, I'm set. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you my coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> A lot of times I see maybe on TV or something somebody talking about their their own religion thing that they follow or whatever you know, and early on they use the word feeling, and and I I've always thought well you know I think uh, self discipline is more the word you should be using <laughs> as you know controlling yourself and uh, not going with just what you feel because you know what we feel is very unreliable yes. <laughs> yeah. it's not a thing to base a, a lifestyle on you know I, I believe in this I actually had a counselee a woman one time who had been unfaithful to her husband and and she said well she said it was just I had a I had such a strong feeling for this other guy mm -hmm. and I thought and she said, you know, you have to go by your feelings. <laughs> and I had such a strong feeling for this guy, you know. So she felt like she just, she had to do that. She had to, to betray her marriage vows because she, the feeling was so strong. It's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? Yeah. That's the feeling of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, the, the resurrection of the body in gen would not, even in general to the Greeks in the, in the ancient world, would not make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, uh, in Acts 17, in, in Athens, uh, uh, in general, the people kind of sneered when Paul got to the point of talking about the resurrection, that, that didn't make any sense at all. That was, you know, that was crazy. Uh, and the way that, but how do the Gnostics, you know, they're going to believe in Jesus Christ as some kind of spiritual um, teacher. What does the resurrection mean? The, the Gospel of Philip says our new clothing that we will have 
life and the future after death is the Word. The Word, of course, is a spiritual thing that makes us new and the Holy Spirit, but not any kind of body. And I think that a lot of Christians sort of see the resurrection is when you die and your spirit goes to heaven and then you live with God spiritually. Uh, they, I think most people really have a kind of a Gnostic view of the resurrection. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I think uh, when we talk classes on heaven and stuff like that, I mean, it's... Uh, it's amazing how many people don't, don't realize that that's, that's not their eternity, to be in heaven with, with, with God. That their eternity is to just to be in, on the new resurrected earth. You know, that's, what, that's what we were made for. We were made as, as physical, spiritual beings together, not, not as just spiritual beings. Paul in First Thessalonians says, uh, uh, talking about those who died, he says, "We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and because and so because we believe Jesus died and rose again, we believe that God." will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. So those who've fallen asleep are with Christ, but then they come with him, and and um, the Lord himself will come, and uh, we will all be caught up. So there's, there's uh, the, and that's at the resurrection when we're all transformed uh, at the coming of Christ. <clears throat> but what, is the, what does it mean to speak of a resurrection body? Is it, it, is it just uh, this old body that is revived again? Uh, what you might call resuscitated? Right. If it's the old body that's just resuscitated, then it, it's going to continue to... You know, if, if your heart stops beating and, you, and you're there in the hospital and they resuscitate you again, bring you back, uh, what's going to happen to your body? Does it continue to decline or decay? Yes. And ultimately, it, ultimately it, you're going to get to the point where they can't resuscitate you, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So it's not really a permanent change, is it? Right. So the, the body uh, that is raised again is not a, not a material body in the sense of, of this flesh and blood, which is subject to decay. But what is it? How do, how do you understand that? And, and, and um, Paul raises that question. People were asking the question. You know, the Gnostics had an answer. Well, there is no actual body as such. It's just the Word and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but Irenaeus points out that the human person is body and spirit. Our identity is not just a spiritual identity, it's a body spiritual identity, male and female specifically, right? A di a, in fact, a, a, a bodily di differentiated identity. Uh, and, and salvation, if God saves me, he has to save me body, soul, and spirit. Not just save my, my soul, but save my body, soul, and spirit. That was Irenaeus' argument. And uh, Tertullian said uh, that the change is not by abolition, it's not by abolishing, but by amplification. Now, what, what does the word amplification mean? The body 
to expand to coming out of the day on top. Could be toxic. Yeah, to make greater. There's an expansion, isn't it? There's a mo something more. Our body, the new resurrection body, is something much more than the body we. It is a body, but it's something much more than the body we have now. Now he doesn't specify exactly what that moreness is, but it is it is something much more, much more glorious. Uh, it has to be more from the perspective of it. It's yeah. no longer corruptible. Right. Uh, if we go to the New Testament, uh, there there's some analogies uh, where you can. Use it's compared to a seed that's planted in the ground and then which sprouts. And the plant that comes up, it, there's a continuity with the seed, isn't there? The DNA, we know the continuity has to do with the DNA, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. but, but it is really very different, isn't it? And yet there's a continuity. Uh, and 2 Corinthians 5 talks about this this body now is like an earthly tent. And uh, then, but then the resurrection, we have a heavenly dwelling. One, so from an earthly kind of tent to a more heavenly, eternal kind of dwelling. Um, the Apostle Paul, I think, has uh, the, the most uh, interesting, and to me, the, the uh, best way of, of talking about that. He, he says, you know, there are different kinds of flesh. And there's the flesh of birds and the flesh of uh, animals. Pork is different from chicken. Beef is different from fish. Right? There's even even materially speaking, we know there are different kinds of flesh. So he, he says, you know, there's different kinds of bodies. Uh, he says we are sowed, we we die, we're buried as a natural body. Uh, and the word the word that's translated natural is the same word that we that we use for soul. Psychica, from psyche, our, from, from which we get the word psychology. Psychology is the study of the mind or the soul, is it? Not, not the physical part of us, but that non-physical part. And, and he says... Our, what they call our psyche, right? Our, we have a psychic, psychical body, a soulish body. What does that mean, a soulish body? Well, I give my interpretation here is that I, I think this body, what he means is that it, it is energized and controlled by what we call life, by, by biological life. The kind of biological life that that uh, uh, energizes everything from an ant to uh, a bacteria, right? Uh, what we call life it, that energizes this physical, makes this matter something more than just dead matter. It's alive, isn't it? But it it's that inner energy that he describes a psychical energy that makes it alive. But that body is subject to death, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's temporary. It winds down. We say from the time we were born, we began to die. The telomeres begin to get shorter and shorter. Uh, and... Uh, but the resurrection body, he says, is a spiritual body. That's a pneumaticon from the word pneuma. We, we talk about pneumatic tires, right? <laughs> Filled with air. Uh, the, word, the word pneuma is 
uh, actually also can mean wind, and it's also the word for spirit. This new body will be a, a spiritual body, which will mean, and this is my understanding, it will be energized. What gives this body life is not a kind of life that will is declining, but a kind of life that is eternal. That's the life of God himself, isn't it? God is a spirit, and he doesn't, he didn't have a beginning, he'll have no end, he doesn't decline. He doesn't get weak or sick, does he? Right. And that's, that's the kind of body we will have, a spiritual body. Uh, the, uh, I uh, am thinking about this. It occurred to me that the, the difference in the body is that one is subject to entropy and the other is not. Entropy means that everything tends to fall into chaos. And it winds down and becomes disorganized instead of holding together. Unless you're, unless you're putting new energy into it all the time. It by itself, though, a system by itself. And our bodies, by themselves, are going to wind down. They are winding down. I can feel mine winding <laughs> <Yeah>. down. <laughs> hey, a lot of winding down. Yeah. Entropy is getting a hold of me. Yeah. <laughs> Third law, third law of thermodynamics. I, I guess, I guess, when somebody asks me how I'm doing, I should say, "Well, doing pretty well, except entropy uh, has really got a hold of me." <laughs> <laughs> this entropy thing's kicking my butt. <laughs> yeah. Contrary to the theory of evolution. But obviously, right? God is not subject to entropy, is he? There's no winding down with him. God can give. But in create, but in giving, he doesn't become any less. Now, when I give Judy a little bit of my money, I'm, I'm a little more poorer than I was before. But when God gives, he, he's, he hasn't lost anything. Has he? Spirituality is not a zero-sum game like the physical world is. The physical world is creating here. You've got to be taking away from something else. Right. No but that's the that's the new spiritual body that we are given. Uh, <clears throat> Paul talks about it. It it being a mortal. New one is immortal, isn't it? The other one was, uh, it was uh, dishonorable, um, the subject to that decay and death. But this body will be a glorious body. Uh, it will be similar to that of the risen Christ. For, uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. Notice that. I think that's a, a key verse to me. Were you? Three twenty-one. Three twenty-one. Read that line. Three twenty-one. Well, we might start with verse twenty. Well, our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our vile bodies, our, our lowly bodies will be transformed. Like to be like his glorious. So whatever. 
and he even he even spoke of that transformation when when he was in the garden talking to Mary and he said, you know, I haven't I don't right. come and hug me, I haven't been transformed yet. Right. Right. But he did say later on, you know, uh, I'm not a ghost. Yeah. Yeah. He said, he ate, he ate with him, actually. And and he told Thomas to touch him. Yeah, touch him. Yeah. So it's not like and, it's yeah. not like a cloud, you know, it's a, it's a physical. On the other hand, he could appear inside a room with locked doors. Right, there you go. How'd you do that? <laughs> so uh, there, there are probably some other physical laws that he's not subject to. Right. <laughs> Besides entropy. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas to you. I'm sure you've heard of you. Well, I have put together this little essay, and I think uh, I kind of uh, tried to uh, talk about uh, the importance of the body and the resurrection of the body in terms of what it means to really be a human being. And, and there are different ways, different philosophies. Uh, there is monism, which is uh, connected mostly with Eastern religions, uh, like Hinduism or Buddhism. That, uh, that, that, that the, the human self is really a, an illusion. Individual persons are simply a drop of water in the ocean of, uh, of reality, of all being. And uh, ultimate salvation is actually, according, is actually being melted back into, or like taking like an individual drop of water and putting it back in the ocean, so that you are merged with and, and you become totally part of oneness. Every molecule in that you can't separate those molecules of of what drop of water because they get dispersed and are united with the great whole. That's, that's salvation, to get rid of individual. It's the abolition of individual identity. Which, which would imply in those religions that your individualism is a negative. It's a negative. Because right. your goal is to get rid of your individualism and become one with the universe. Of course, in the biblical view, individuality is something very created by God. And that each person individually is important to God, made in the image of God. Do, do you realize how many how many times we hear nowadays people talking about the universe, trying to personify the universe? They talk about well, the, the universe must have intended this, or you know, the universe wanted this to happen, or the universe. You know, I, you know, you hear those things and you go, "What are you talking about? You know, who are you?" Well, did you hear that thing well, <laughs> yesterday? They were talking about they want trees and plants to have the same rights as humans. I mean, that's really the same type of thing. You know, you're yeah, all yeah. part of that. Yeah, they're all living entities. Yeah, right. There is the universe, in a sense, is God. That, that, that is, you know. But they refuse to use the, the, the There's term. this unity, this monism. Whatever God is, whatever the spirit is, is the same thing as what the universe is. It's all one. There's no distinction between the creator and the creation. And that's why they can talk about the creation. The creation seems to be doing so and so because they identify the creation with the creator. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's, of course, materialism. You know what that is? That we're just uh, every we're just a conglomeration of 
of atoms that are controlled by a certain physical and chemical laws. That's all we are. And every thought in your mind is actually due to uh, certain uh, uh, things going on in your neurons. And uh, that's all we are, just these neurological connections, these electrochemical reactions going on in your brain give, give rise to a thought yeah, and to the idea that you are a, an individual person, which is, and again, the, the, the fact that you're an individual person is kind of an illusion. It's just the result of all of these chemical reactions that, that seem to give you the impression that, that you are something different than the, the chemical makeup of your brain. Uh, that was a view espoused by the ancient Greek Epicureans. Uh, which, of course, in that view, uh, if life is nothing but, but uh, and you're nothing but matter, then all that matters is what gives you pleasure today. Now, they didn't define pleasure solely as, as physical pleasure, but anything that makes you happy, you know, whatever pleases you or makes you happy. Uh, you just live, maximize that as much as you can. And then there's, there is a, the dualism that goes back to Plato, that there is matter, but there is also a spiritual. And these kind of get put together in, in, a, in a physical body, but, you know, your, your true nature is, your, is that spiritual nature. It has nothing to do with your body. That's your true identity, is the spirit, spiritual part. That's the Gnostic view. Uh, and then there's a biblical view. What, what is a human person? Well, first of all, we're created, right? Which means we're dependent on the Creator, who alone is immortal. We are creatures. We are mortal. Uh, some... Um, Although I think there are some people who think the soul has existed for all eternity and then God took it and put it into a body. Did it hurt? Did it hurt? The account of creation doesn't seem to look at it that way. So if you look at the book of Genesis, how are we created? Genesis 1, 25, 27, I mean. Yeah. Uh, so God, God created man in his own image. <coughs> and he created a male and female. Right. Uh, and then uh, in chapter two, there's another reference to the to the creation of of uh, of mankind. In verse seven, Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Yes. It's, it's this combination of the breath of God and the dust of the ground, isn't it? It's funny, your, your, uh, your version said a living being. This is a, a King James is a living soul. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. And it, the word of soul is used there. Yeah. Yeah. There's this unity of soul and body that makes us a biological living creature. Right. But we're distinct 
from the other creatures by being made in God's image. Right. We are a, we are a, we are an animal. We're living beings. We have this biological life, as Paul says, we are this psychical body, biological life, just like all the animals. But what's different about us, what's different in the image of God? Right. And we could you know, talk about that, but that does make, that's what's different with a human being. <clears throat> And, and then, and so redemption, if God saves us, then he has to save us body, soul, and spirit. If you make a distinction between the soul, but actually, uh, it's sort of like, uh, instead of the soul that's united with the body, the very spirit of God is united with a new body that will be eternal. That seems to be the biblical view. This, this pneumaticon body, this spiritual body, which is the resurrection body. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I don't know whether we can answer all these questions to our full satisfaction but I'd like to close with 1 John 3 2 <laughs> we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet been revealed so we're, we're probably uh, trying to peer through a curtain that has not been fully opened what we will be hasn't really been made fully clear. Mm -hmm. We know that whenever it is revealed, we will be like Him. When it is revealed, we will be like Him. That's that glorious body like Jesus said. Because we will see Him just as He is. That's a good way to close this discussion. We realize that we don't see everything clearly. It's understanding, but we do know this. We'll be like him. I, you know, I think too that one of the things that's meaningful to me about that verse is that it says what we will be has not yet been made known. Okay, has not been revealed. Which which gives us gives us reason to not worry about that because it's not it's not that he's told us and we haven't figured it out it's not that well you know we just need to keep trying to figure this out we need to look for more no it hasn't been revealed and, and we're not going to know it now so you can relax a little you know? Yeah, that's right <laughs> you know it's not a question of of well I need to study more I need to do this more I need to figure this out no it's not re revealed and and it will be eventually if but you're, not now if you're a physicist you can't understand entropy but you, there's no way to understand what uh, a, a, a a reality is that, that is not a, that does not suffer entropy mm -hmm. I don't think there's any physicist that can, uh, can tell you Put that into a mathematical formula. They can put it into mathematical formulas how entropy works, but they cannot understand how. And, and of course, to some people say, well, since I can't understand it, that means it can't possibly be. Right? Yeah, hence, hence the idea of dark energy and dark matter, right? Because I, I have to be able to explain this somehow, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but they can't. That's just another way of saying that, that hasn't been revealed. Right, either. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But they talk about it as matter and energy, as if it were somehow they're similar to to the matter and energy that we do understand. But is it is it any? But it but it operates according to different laws, apparently, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't operate according to uh, the laws that uh, you would study in a physics textbook. So, and and now they are they are seeing things that don't seem to follow the normal quote, quote unquote laws in, in terms of quantum physics. Okay, I mean these two things that are far apart somehow communicate with one another, but there's no there's no communication between them. You know, and they they don't understand that. You know, they don't have a way to they don't have a way to adequately explain how it happens. They're just observing that it does happen. Okay, and you know that's kind of like the definition of a miracle, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, uh, not understanding that, you, you know, you know, from a, a quantum dolphins quantum. have variable frequency sonar. Mm -hmm. They don't have any idea how that works. I mean, there's the, we don't have that, you know. Man, the, the dolphins do that all the time. They yeah. Yeah. I was saw this program the other time about the quant quantum computer, and, and I can't, I don't understand that, of course, and it's based on quantum physics. And all. But uh, the, the, the chips we have now are based on uh, 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 either uh, uh, a yes or a no, a plus or a minus. Mm -hmm. One zero. Yeah. And, and you've only got those two possibilities as you're doing computations. You, you do a series of computations, but you always are going either yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, one after the other. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a quantum computer, and they use this analogy, which really kind of was meaningful to me. With a coin, you either have a heads or a tail, don't you? <clears throat> but if you if you flip a coin and that coin is turning, what? How many? Uh, uh, it, it can turn quarter-wise, sort of halfway. It can turn this way, this way. How many different positions can that coin take? If it were, if it were just flipped in the air, really, it can turn in, in, in all directions, in all uh, different planes, axes, right? So how many are there? <laughs> they seem to say it's almost infinite. Uh, yeah. uh, infinite. Yeah. The number of positions that it could take, and that's what quantum computing is based upon. That it's, it's, it's almost a kind of an infinite number. Instead of yes or no, you, you go you go from two yes or no to an infinite number of possibilities. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Which would say that that would really massively transform computations. Oh, yeah. That would mean, of course, that that uh, any quantum computer could figure out any password you've got in a matter of a second or two. So all of your passwords are going right. <laughs> because it can go all go through all of them combinations so quickly. They the can solve problems that they say on a computer now would take maybe take 20 or 30 years. They can solve it just in a matter of a couple of seconds. It's almost like the mind of God. <laughs> Especially in the end. Well, okay. Uh, well, we're going to take a couple of weeks off, right, guys? Right. Come back after New Year's. Uh, the Friday after New Year's? Yeah. Well, I hope 